Today, we're going to talk about capitalist realism and the new Hollywood, two subjects which intersect in, I think, really important ways because capitalist realism was just becoming, in effect, as the new Hollywood was born in the late 1960s and early 70s. So there's a kind of coincidence, temporal coincidence, between the two, and even a thematic coincidence, I think, that, that in some ways the new Hollywood takes up capitalist realism as its subject. And when we're in the epoch of capitalist realism, what follows from that is a belief in the commodity. The commodity almost becomes deified. And it makes me think of the idea of a best commodity. And there's this guy, he was golfing one time, and he says to his friend, I have the absolute best golf ball. And his friend's like, wow, why is that? What's, what, what's the deal with it? He goes, well, you hit it into the woods. It makes a sound so you can find it. You hit it in somewhere dark. It shines a light so you can get to it. And if you hit it in the water, it not only floats, but it comes back to you from the water. And the guy's like, amazing, where do you get this ball? And the guy goes, I found it. So I think this shows that every commodity has its weaknesses, right? So even the commodity, the golf ball that seems perfect, it had to be lost by somebody in order for the guy to find it. So let's move on then to capitalist realism, which we should try to undermine with a little irrealism like we see in that joke. Capitalist realism is a concept coined by Mark Fisher in his book, Capitalist Realism. Unfortunately, Mark Fisher only lived into his late 40s. He died in 2017 of suicide. And Fisher's idea is that capitalist realism prevails when people believe that capitalism is the only possible game in town. That is, that there are no alternatives to capitalism. It's just what we have, or it's human nature. And he finds that inspiration in the important Marxist thinker, Frederick Jameson, who famously claims that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And one of the proofs that he has for the, this thesis is that there are all these disaster films that show the world ending, but capitalism continues even after the disaster that ends the world. So Hollywood's able to envision end of the world catastrophes, but not a catastrophe sufficient enough to end capitalism. And when capitalism realism reigns, we begin to view hope as a dangerous illusion. Why? Well, how could hope be dangerous? Well, the idea is that advocating another path outside of capitalism, being hopeful for something different, is to become implicitly complicit with Stalinism and the gulag. So the idea is we know where communism and socialism lead. They lead right to the gulag. Better not go down that path. Better embrace unbridled capitalism instead. Capitalism real, capitalist realism makes itself felt, Fisher claims, as a malaise. So I don't feel like I can do anything. I can't change anything. So I just feel I'm stuck in a malaise. And I think this is one of the, we can see this, the first connection with 70s New Hollywood is the figure of Bobby in Five Easy Pieces, who is really alienated, dissatisfied with everything that he has, every relationship, every possibility that capitalist society offers him. But he never thinks about a political solution to his situation. He doesn't join a union. He doesn't try to march. He doesn't write his congressperson. He doesn't do anything. All he does is get up on a truck and traffic and start playing the piano and then drive off to who knows where. So he just does these crazy things, but he never really challenges the political system in which he is ensconced and which is, causes him so much suffering. So Bobby's attempts to go his own way are merely idiosyncratic, never anti-capitalist. What's interesting is he lived in a time when, this is the early 70s, when there were real anti-capitalist movements, but he doesn't take part in them. And we see a similar apolitical rage right in the opening of Cool Hand Luke. Let's take a look at that.
So Luke ends up in jail and, uh, for a long time because of this stupid prank. And, and he just doesn't, there's no reason for him doing it. This destructiveness, un, uh, undoing the, the meter, the top of the meter off of the post. He doesn't want to steal the money. It's just a pure antisocial, idiosyncratic act that has zero political content. And that's the that's the thing that Mark Fisher is noticing and that that the new Hollywood is focusing on these acts that are outside of the seemingly outside of the social order, but actually are part of it because they never challenge it. So the idea of capitalist realism is there is no outside to the oppressive capitalist structure. So there's really nothing you can do. And this is interesting in terms of music, I think. So earlier, jazz and rock had egalitarian, even sometimes socialist aspirations. But today, popular music accedes to the capitalist reality. And we see this in gangster rap and gangster films, which, according to Fisher, ensconce us in the mindset of capitalist realism. So they're either about making money or accumulating a number of sexual partners. So there's no interest in challenging the capitalist system. So films like The Godfather or Reservoir Dogs, they show people that are behaving in thing, ways that are criminal, but they're not in ways that challenge the capitalist system. In fact, these criminals are more invested in the capitalist system than the most rabid capitalists. As Fisher says, the affinity between hip hop and gangster movies such as Scarface, The Godfather films, Reservoir Dogs, Goodfellas and Pulp Fiction arises from their common claim to have stripped the world of sentimental illusions and seen it for what it really is, a Hobbesian war of all against all, a system of perpetual exploitation and generalized criminality. So the point is, the idea is that we think we're seeing these films point and make it clear that we're seeing how things really are, that really everyone. And this is clear in Godfather, all the Godfather sequence, that the, the, the way in which the criminals act is just mirroring the way in which legitimate society acts. And so the point is, that's all there is. There's no there's nothing behind this system of exploitation. And we see this in Chinatown, how the, uh, this attitude of capitalist realism can create just a senseless idea of accumulating more and more and more for no reason at all. How much are you worth? I have no idea. How much do you want? No, I just want to know what you're worth. Over 10 million? Oh, my, yes. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gitz. The future. So the future is just this abstract thing that just he just wants to accumulate more and more and more. Uh, so it's great. So there's never enough. And that's part of what we see in capitalist realism. And we also see a super identification, Fisher calls it, with capital. So that even alternative music is just a category within the capitalist classifications rather than a fundamental challenge to the classifications themselves. This is a really nice point that Fisher makes, I think. So another way to think about it is that anti-capitalism has become part of contemporary capitalism, that even mega corporations include critiques of capitalism within their products and within their advertising. Poverty becomes a moral issue rather than a political one. I think this is one of the main problem areas that Fisher's focused on. As he sees it, celebrity humanitarians actually help to inculcate us with the idea that we should invest ourselves in moral philanthropy rather than in political activity. So Bono would be one of the... for. For Fisher, one of the exemplary perpetuators of this turn from politics to morality. And the proper political position becomes nothing but buying the correct products 
and avoiding the incorrect ones. And Fisher's point is this is not political at all. And thus he contrasts capitalist realism with what he calls, borrowing from the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, the real. And the real is what disrupts and breaks down the reign of this realism. Or you could say it like this, the real marks a point of rupture. And Fisher wonders if maybe the ecological catastrophe might be this real that could rupture capitalist realism. Or maybe it's this. The problem is that these forms of possible real disruptions get reduced to reality by something like green capitalism. So hopefully you didn't fall for this. But even if you don't fall for it, it still works because the whole point is we end up doing our due diligence to capitalist realism, even if we call it into question. So even if we look at this and say, oh, my God, McDonald's is not on the side of the environment because, I mean, just eating that number of cows, they're just they're destroying the rainforests alone. Right. But we nonetheless go to McDonald's. So that's the point. The other thing that Fisher notices is there's a loss of any authority at all and, and a corresponding loss of discipline. And this is especially problematic because it's discipline that actually would allow us to mount a political challenge to capitalist realism. And we also would need to be able to pay attention to read things like Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism, but this is what we lose the ability, an ability we lose the ability to do when we're stuck within capitalist realism. So one of the things that it's breaking down is our ability to constantly pay attention and to focus. As he puts it, ask students to read for more than a couple of sentences, and many, and these are A-level students, mind you, will protest that they can't do it. So this isn't necessarily my experience, but I think this is one reason why he's making capitalist realism, why he makes the book so short. It's only 80 pages because he thinks people won't have the attention span to read a longer book. He thinks we've created, with a nice illusion, a new flesh that's too wired to concentrate. Here's what he's alluding to. The new flesh is actually a living death. And I think this is why zombie films are so popular in the epoch of capitalist realism, because we actually have become rendered zombies by this capitalist realism. The point is that capitalism doesn't simply keep going on its own. Nation states have to practice what Fisher calls market Stalinism, to keep the market stable and going. So there is all kinds of intervention to keep this capitalist system functioning. And he sees a new bureaucracy taking over within the capitalist world, which is part of capitalist realism. One example of this would be the way in which you have to navigate a labyrinth to find someone to speak to in customer service. Some companies like PayPal, you can't even find an email address to email someone to find to make a complaint about customer service. And this would be a nice ideological depiction of how customer service functions. Instead, we get call center angst, which predominates. And this is what you get whenever you have to call in to a call center. And at the end of the book, Fisher talks about the great Alan Pakula film, The Parallax View, which in many different ways shows how capitalist realism operates. The main figure of the film, Joe Frady, played by Warren Beatty, not only has no individual agency in the film, but when he tries to take action himself, he ends up playing a crucial role in actually perpetuating the conspiracy he's trying to undo. So his attempt to investigate and expose the heart of the conspiracy, this Parallax Corporation, ends up providing it with a patsy 
for the assassination of another political leader. He was at the assassination of a political leader at the beginning of the film, and then at the end of the film, another one is assassinated. And what's clear is that there's no way out. The open door that he sees at the end of the film actually is trying to escape from the Parallax Corporation. This open door is actually where we see an assassin lurking. Let's take a quick look at that. I see him! So you think there's a way out, and there's only a hired killer right there. So the parallax view never shows the motivations of the corporation or what it gains from its conspiracies. It doesn't see, it seems it doesn't seem to lead anywhere. It's not important because that's part of the way in which we're ensconced in this capitalist realism. And we also don't see anyone who's in charge of the Parallax Corporation. We see various people affiliated with it, but never even a moderate, a mid-level manager we don't see. It simply keeps going on destructively without any clear benefits or goals that we can make out. And that's how this is the connection that Fisher makes to capitalist realism. As he says, although presumably corporate, the interests and motives of the conspiracy in the parallax view are never articulated, perhaps not even to or by those actually involved in it. Who knows what the parallax corporation really wants? Capitalist, it, capitalism itself, for Fisher, is the conspiracy. So we don't need to find conspiracies within. We need to instead look at capitalism itself as a conspiracy. That's his point. And even if one's not an anti-capitalist, there's no, there's no requirement that you be an anti-capitalist, one should instead at least see that capitalism is not identical with reality, that that's what Fisher's trying to get us to look at. But instead, it's the result of a collective choice that everyone makes. And 1970s cinema, the new Hollywood, shows us how this choice becomes obfuscated in the imperatives of capitalist realism. I think capitalist realism provides an incredibly poignant point of entry into the new Hollywood and a way of thinking about it. I think some of the new Hollywood films succumb to capitalist realism and others are trying to be critical of it. But even those that are trying to be critical of it oftentimes succumb to it. So I think this is one of the real challenges of Mark Fisher's great book is to think about how the new Hollywood relates to capitalist realism, how it can help us to get a grip on it and how it can help us to see what it means to fall victim to it.